the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, uh, she heard hers, and I am the Senior Partnerships Manager here at All Voices. Today, I'm super, we're excited to welcome our next guest onto the interview series, Stephen Huang, Justice, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, aka JEDI, Officer at MAPS, which stands for a Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Stephen, so good to see you uh, remotely uh, for our interview. Thank you so much for being a guest. If you want to share a little bit about yourself for our listeners, uh, including when you were younger, how you answered the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And if you can touch on our recent conversation at HR Transform, where you talked about how your gender identity uh, and pronouns have changed over time as well. Awesome. Will do. Nice to see you again, Christina. Um, and hi, everyone who's listening or watching. Um, whew, yeah, okay. So um, I guess I'll start by saying I don't really remember what I wanted to be as a grown up, as a grown up. <laughs> I, I think I probably repressed a lot of childhood memories. Um, you know, some of my early memories were around holidays. Um, and I loved Halloween because candy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I was a dinosaur for like multiple years because it was a hand-me-down costume. And then I think it was fifth grade where I had outgrown the dinosaur costume. And I went to my neighbor's closet and she was the same age as me. Um, Kelsey was born like a month after me, She's my next door neighbor. And she had this Girl Scout outfit because she was a Girl Scout. It fit, it was fun, it had a cute headband. Yeah. I thought it was going to be so popular, mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't, <laughs> you know, a lot of like looks and like, oh, Steven's a Girl Scout. Um, it wasn't, um, I couldn't like grapple with it then, you know, but I think what I understood was that um, like gender had boundaries. Mm -hmm. I wasn't supposed to do feminine things, you know, even on the day where I, I could be a vampire or a zombie. <laughs> or dinosaur, but I could not be female, off the table. Uh, so I think I recognized, you know, life was gonna be pretty hard because soon after started to realize I'm gay, hella gay. Um, so, you know, I spent the next two decades ensuring that I stayed within those boundaries, my gender, because it was safer for me to do so. I mean, I towed the line where I could. Um, but in a recent ayahuasca retreat um, earlier this year, my gender came up and then it came out <laughs> and I, I realized that the boundaries that come with gender, and by the way, women have even narrower boundaries than men. <laughs> those boundaries suck, you know, <laughs> those boundaries are the source of pain and confusion and I'm not into it, I'm not about that. So um, you can use any gender pronoun you like for me, he, she, they, um, I respond to all of them. I feel affinity to all of them. I have the privilege because of um, my social status and my environment here in San Francisco where I just, those, I just feel like those boundaries are irrelevant to me. Mm -hmm. um, I identify now as someone who is gender relaxed. Mm -hmm. um, credit the Gen Z folks for coming up with all sorts of terms. Gender isn't a relaxing thing for most people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I acknowledge that, but I refuse to give gender any power over how I talk or how I dress. Mm -hmm. or who I am, you know, in the boardroom, in the bedroom, <laughs> meow. Um, you know, after my ayahuasca retreat, the day after, I get a call from MAPS, and they want me to apply for the role that I'm in now, the Justice, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion Officer, mm -hmm. and it just, it made sense. It, it was kind of a coincidence, but I was like, I don't really believe in coincidences anymore, um, and that is the role that I'm in now. But I've had DEI and HR roles for over a decade, mostly in the tech industry. Mm -hmm. Well, number one, thank you so much for sharing that context and your, a little bit about your journey to MAPS and your journey with identity. And I definitely agree with you around these super strict boundaries around gender, gender roles, the boxes that people in society, I would say, love to put folks in as well. And I, I just appreciate you having that conversation. Mm. Me. Thank you for giving me the platform. This is the first time I've kind of talked about it um, yeah. on something that I'm going to share. So appreciate you. Oh my gosh, absolutely. I appreciate you 
too. And I know at the, the conference we were at together, I had the privilege and opportunity to hear you speak on a panel and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with you too. And uh, for folks who aren't as uh, familiar with, with maps um, and also uh, I put your bio uh, in the in the show notes as well, but can you dig a little bit deeper into what your journey was to, to your Jedi work at MAPS? Yeah, a lot of hard work and psychedelics, <laughs> um, which is how I ended up at the Association for Psychedelic Studies. Mm -hmm. um, I started my career as a life insurance actuary. People love that kind of fun fact. <laughs> about it. It's so different than where I ended up. Yes. Um, but to this day, I'm a very analytical and numbers driven practitioner. Um, but that wasn't the right role for me. And um, it was really through leveraging psychedelics that allowed me to tap into my meaning and my purpose. And I realized I wanted to be um, something where I could have a lot of impact. And I saw that as tech. So I moved to San Francisco, kind of got closer to that world. I was doing some more psychedelics. I realized I want to work in what was then called HR analytics. Now people analytics is an interchangeable term because it was like the numbers and the people. Um, and then during another psychedelic experience, I felt like this deep inclusion and belonging. And I was like, ah, this is what DEI is about. Like I need to pivot full time into this kind of work. And then during COVID, you can follow the trend here. I'm doing more psychedelics in a way that was just really profound for me. And I, and I wanted to focus my social justice work in health equity in the psychedelic space because psychedelics have historically been um, not available or accessible um, or legal for, for folks. So yeah. I ended up at MAPS, which is a nonprofit that has been working on the medical uses of psychedelics for healing for 36 years. I mean, I didn't know a lot about drug psychedelic therapy and a lot of the kind of health equity work that's happening in, in the space too until meeting you and doing my own kind of research as well. For folks who aren't familiar with you know, psychedelic assisted therapy, psychedelic therapy, how would you kind of define that or share it? So I know we can go definitely into the weeds of it, but just like a, a general intro overview, if you will. Yeah, so psychedelic therapy uh, in a nutshell, is combining psychoactive substances that change the way you think and process things in combination <clears throat> with therapy. Mm -hmm. So the psychedelic kind of non-ordinary state of consciousness is temporary, um, but doing that in conjunction with therapy is really powerful because it, um, it decreases your fight or flight response, mm -hmm. uh, increases the ability, you know, your oxytocin and your ability to approach these kind of like difficult traumatic memories that you've had with more safety. Mm -hmm. So those two things combined with therapy allow you to go deeper um, and process things that maybe felt too um, uncomfortable or dangerous to approach without the, the psychedelic um, changing your brain temporarily. Yeah, I think that is really important for self-awareness and also uh, just people who have gone through a lot of, of trauma or just are familiar with trauma and in general too and opening up that access to psychedelic therapy too through your employer as well and as someone who is in kind of this role of justice equity diversity and inclusion um for the first time for uh for this role at the organization where did you even begin to start to prioritize where you wanted to start with projects or have the most impact and, and yeah like that? <laughs> and like MAPS being a 36-year-old nonprofit, there's really cool, ambitious, shiny object, and there's also like really cool sure. basic needs too. So <clears throat> uh, I would say the cool thing about working at uh, an established nonprofit is that the mission is super clear. Mm -hmm. Whereas in, in tech startup land, where I was for you know a decade, you expect to pivot and you're like, got to get your ACV up, your CAC down, what's your magic number? <laughs> With all these like metrics, yeah. you know, do it before your runway runs out, and you got twelve months. <clears throat> Whereas, you know, and maps, and I think in a lot of nonprofits, the priorities here are fairly clear. Um, our our big focus right now is bringing MDMA, <clears throat> also known as Molly, mm -hmm. bringing that to market in a way that is accessible and affordable, um, in a way that reduces health inequality rather than add to it. Um, 
the war on drugs in America was was actually a race war. I mean, not so much a drug war, it's primarily a race war. So there's a ton of stigma for BIPOC communities, even though access to psychedelics is a cultural birthright for Black and Indigenous communities. So health equity took a big focus for me early on, ensuring we have diverse therapists, ensuring we diversify our clinical trial participants, um, that we have fact-based drug education and advocacy, <clears throat> harm reduction, training for first responders, um, as MDMA will be a medicine in, in 18 months. And I will say, when I joined the org, the organization was already doing a lot of these things. So I'm not going to take credit for everything that we've done, but I am kind of um, aligning and coalescing and making sure our messaging um, is tight. But every day, uh, you have a bunch of different things you can be working on, and every day is different as well. And the folks that work at the, the nonprofit too are really behind the, the mission as well. So a lot of a lot of great work being done by awesome folks too. And I know you talked about kind of the birth rate of uh, black indigenous people of color having access to kind of the psychedelics and psychedelic therapy. And I want really want to make sure we're making the implicit explicit here too in terms of what the relationship is between mm -hmm. psychedelic therapy, justice, what you talked about too at the top of the, the conversation, health equity, um, and also diversity, inclusion, trauma healing, the role of, of community leaders too. Um, it's a big question, but yeah, I yeah, want yeah. to open up. <laughs> totally. And <clears throat> I think if you've, if you've experimented with psychedelics before and you know, you've done some DEI work or social justice work, you're like, oh yeah, you can make the link. But if you're missing one of those links, you're like, what's going on? Like, where are we? <laughs> yeah. Fair. And like I said, I was, you know, I, I like to alter my mind. And so those links kind of even took me a while to kind of start to piece together. So um, I guess I'll start, you know, you mentioned the word justice. And justice is really important in this work. You know, I still call myself a DEI practitioner, but in the work that we do in the psychedelic space, when I think about health equity, I think about justice. Right. Um, we we often have accountability um, now for when things go wrong, but those things shouldn't go wrong in the first place. And that's really what justice is about. When I think about Jedi work and DEI work, a lot of it starts around examining structures of power mm -hmm. and reevaluating if those structures are, um, you know, <laughs> Uh, creating intergenerational trauma and pain, and how do we remove those barriers? And I think uh, psychedelics help you really expand and be able to think more innovatively um, around designing more, like, more innovative solutions. And that sounds kind of abstract. Um, an example is that psychedelic therapy um, is being explored to treat race-based PTSD. Mm -hmm. uh, we sponsored studies to heal Israeli-Palestinian conflict with ayahuasca. Um, we're starting to measure how psychedelics can epigenetically alter how your brain stores traumatic memories into a more positive way, another fascinating study. So a lot of core corporate DEI work is about increasing part to, um, representation, making inclusive cultures and structures. But the, the root, the tap root of a lot of these things does revolve around healing trauma, um, building justice into our systems, into our business models. There are a lot of things that we can do in HR, but I think more on a more grand scale sometimes. Mm -hmm. I, I would say, you know, the, the industrial complex of the DEI industry and frankly, the commoditization of George, George Floyd's murder doesn't sit well with me. Um, there's a lot of performative work being done out there. Um, I'm, I'm excited to explore more radical solutions that might work. Yeah. <laughs> this connection between justice, trauma healing, collective liberation. I'm still unearthing all of those things, all of those connections. Absolutely. I, I appreciate you providing that context and kind of full picture there as well uh, for folks who are listening, just uh, so we are defining all of our terms too. Can you talk about what you mean by the industrial uh, complex? Yeah, um, there was a good article in The Cut about this. Well, I, know, I didn't really speak. Yeah, I didn't really speak about me in a positive light, but that's okay. <laughs> um, 
you know, the spinning up of a lot of different uh, things that can be sold, software and solutions and consulting and different right. tools. Um, and, and a lot of these tools are helpful and do solve certain needs. But I think sometimes we are overemphasizing, um, trying to build nice little tools and, and scorecards and metrics to the work when so much of this work is really deeply personal. Um, we might not fix this problem, this generation. Chances are we won't, but I like to strive for it. Um, and uh, a lot of the DEI industry is looking for short-term solutions to very long-term and historical, probably historical problems. Thank you for, for describing that. I think that is definitely relatable to a lot of folks who are listening as well, not as a blanket statement, but I think we've all seen the commoditization, especially as we are approaching uh, Pride as well, which a lot of um, mm. organizations like to capitalize on to sell goods and services too, which is not what uh, this part, the whole celebration and honoring is about as well. Um, getting specific around how MAPS is intentionally not, you know, trying to perpetuate and really breaking the cycle of trauma. You mentioned inter intergenerational trauma, which is huge as well. How are you thinking about kind of breaking that internally through employee policy and culture, knowing that, like what you said, a lot of this is around you know, that internal work and these, these big, hairy problems will not be solved tomorrow, let alone next year. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm glad you brought up pride. That's that's a really good example of some of this like conflict. Like, yeah, like oh, we have to have a way for corporate America to participate, but inherently it can be difficult to thread the needle. Um, so your question is like, how? What is Maps doing to yeah. uh, play our part? We're not perfect. And I, <laughs> I find that to be <laughs> a lot of organizations, you know, it's like, you're like, you're trying to serve this mission, but you look inward and you like, you kind of like ignore some of the inner work that we yeah. do. So we're working on it. Um, we are trying to put in some, you know, internal policies um, and, and cultural things. Um, and not all of those things have to be expensive or cost money to just hold space for how we think about healing trauma, right. Right. Um, you know, within, the work that we do. So we, we do talk a lot about trauma at work. We make sure we have trigger warnings. Uh, we do our best. Um, and I think one thing that we're doing is we are thinking about like, how do we help other companies um, address this kind of uh, trauma work, you know, inner child work in their cultures? So a big part of the nonprofit is around advocacy um, and policy and education and, and really destigmatizing these conversations, psychedelics, but also mental health. Um, and that's one thing that we try to model internally and we hope other companies can follow suit. Absolutely, acknowledging where you are as an organization is really important as well. And looking at kind of ways you can really operationalize, really create space, whether it's policies, whether it's having um, you know, those hard conversations and equipping people with the tools to do so uh, is really important as well, because it's not like we are, like I said at the beginning, checking our identity or experiences, our childhood trauma at the door when we go to the virtual office or in-person office too, and it affects all of our relationships mm -hmm. too. Um, mm -hmm. I know I've been asking a lot about psychedelic therapy, the work that you do at MAPS, which I think is really important, and it is a conversation that is continuously kind of destigmatizing what people think about psychedelic therapy. And I want to ask for, for leaders who are not at the point where they're like, I want psychedelic therapy as my next employer benefit. I really want to explore this topic. There are ways for leaders to be intentionally inclusive and create mm -hmm. that space. Mm -hmm. From your experience, uh, what does that look like in terms of inclusive, modern, authentic, not check the box, like effective mm. leaders. If you have any example, any tangible examples, I think that'd be helpful too. So many abstract examples. <laughs> 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 How many reasonable, uh, uh, you know, tangible examples. Okay, so one tangible example I would say is um, 
for leaders to adopt this mindset of being a trauma-informed leader. Um, and that can manifest in a few ways, like, like learning tips on nonviolent communication. Um, these kind of sound like buzzwords, but there's actually a lot of like research behind nonviolent communication and being trauma-informed, being a trauma-informed leader. Um, and the way that, that I think that that's like a very like modern thing is to recognize we're in pretty traumatizing and triggering times these days. Um, and a good leader can acknowledge that their employees as humans carry the weight of this trauma and in many cases, intergenerational trauma. Um, as a leader, you can examine, do I, this leader also have some trauma that I might be carrying? Mm -hmm. Like addressing that first before your trauma manifests itself into some crappy behaviors that your direct reports have to deal with. Yeah. Um, you know, being there for your employees as we all navigate life. Um, once you've addressed and worked on your own trauma, you can be there for others. Um, and, you know, and, and I think older generations have a different perception of the word trauma than maybe younger generations, but yeah. broadly talking about mental health, um, especially now that we're all kind of like, not everyone, but I guess some of us are getting back to the office, but that fact that we've been on Zoom for a long time, it does remove the ability to build authentic connections in many ways, especially you know this water cooler conversation. So um, modeling by talking about mental health, um, just any symptoms of mental health that you've had does create the psychological safety for other people to share, get the help that they need. I think that trauma-informed leadership is really helpful, again, as a leader taking on that responsibility and doing your own research around nonviolent communication. What does that look like? How am I showing up? as well and how is that manifesting on you know if I'm having a bad day and communicating that to uh, your team members especially if you are communicating with them remotely um, via slack or another platform how that might come off and just being really aware of that too in terms of conversation yeah. Right yeah. yeah it's kind of like you know I think this became popular a decade ago like oh it's IQ and it's EQ you know and I think trauma, being trauma informed is just the, the 2022 pandemic version of EQ. It's just be aware that trauma exists and it affects your employees in work and, and when they're off the clock. Absolutely. When they are off, quote unquote, off the clock, we're thinking about work uh, as well. And it definitely affects how, how we show up in our day to day lives, too. Um, for people who really have that intention of creating this space and being really inclusive, especially of folks who have been historically on the margins of society or just haven't had a real kind of voice as well at the organization. Do you have like any advice around how they can really, again, authentically um, mm -hmm. create, you know, space for folks and really think about accessibility and inclusive design in processes, whether that is through offering kind of benefits around mental health, whether it's therapy, psychedelic therapy, et cetera, or other other ways? Yeah. So, so your question is like, um, if you're building, you know, an inclusive uh, company culture and you're thinking about like, what tactics do you have to design yeah. to make sure that um, folks feel included? Well, I think there's two things you should do kind of concurrently. <laughs> First, think about the people that maybe face the most marginalization um, in your workforce. Yeah. Um, you know, design for the folks that have some of the most challenges. Um, maybe that's someone who might be undocumented, uh -huh, which is a tough one that happens in some workforces. Um, you know, maybe think about the Black woman, for example. Know, who faces intersectional marginalization. So that's first, like think about the employees and design the processes for them. And then secondly, think about the employees that you don't have <laughs> and then make sure your processes work for them because maybe there's a reason you don't have that kind of employee. So if you have an employee with a, uh, a, a vision or a hearing disability or any trans employees, like, or, you know, maybe you're missing openly trans employees, what about your... Uh, company culture, design system, structure um, might be in, in, in an, unintentionally excluding these people. Mm -hmm. So just really thinking about the marginalized folks broadly in society, whether they're in your org or not, 
how do you design something for them? Absolutely. I appreciate those kind of examples yeah. and those questions to ask yourself. Too. Okay, one example um, I think is good is um, when you are in a recruiting process, mm -hmm. if you've been in you know um, middle upper class America, you generally know how an interview goes. You're expected to ask thoughtful questions. You look people up on LinkedIn to understand their history, to try to build some affinity. You maybe know the common, you know, interview questions, things like that. Yeah. Um, one thing a recruiter can do is if they're reaching out to a candidate and make sure all candidates have this, be like, hey, here's what it's like to interview at this org. You know, these are the, we're going to tell you who we, who you're going to interview with. You're expected Prepare to ask people. questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, you know, <laughs> we, we can't just assume everyone no. knows what we've learned maybe being, you know, part of corporate America for all of our careers. Absolutely. Not making those assumptions and really thinking about how can we best prepare this person to, to succeed in the, in the interview as well. I think that's also really important. Mm -hmm. And I, I definitely appreciate that example as well. And what made me think of this too, is if there are no, you know, parents at your organization or someone that's talked about their family, why, why is that? That doesn't mean at kind of a, a startup organization as well. You need to have a parental leave policy. You need to have benefits in order. You need to think right. about why would they want to work with you if you don't have yeah. those, uh, things in place as well. So really setting setting that up for success in your your company and make sure people feel like they can bring their ex uh, selves to to work. Stephen, more of a you know a, a more general question, but if you had a magic wand, what do you wish your organization had right now and why? <laughs> So many things. <laughs> uh, we're nonprofit, so you know, funding, money, donation. Um, okay, so you know what would really help my organization um, is if your organization, you know, you listener watcher, um, if your organization talked about psychedelic healing, you know, so much of our uh, challenge. And the struggle that we've been carrying for so long is like this uphill battle to fight all this stigma. Um, and we have found a lot of support from our psychedelic allies to talk about this, to move the needle in a way like, okay, cool. The psychedelic people are telling you it's not bad. Okay. Yeah. But when you have like, um, you know, veteran organizations and you right. have veterans speak out about it. It's like, oh, wow, people listen. Mm -hmm. And I wish more CEOs and more business leaders would talk openly about psychedelics that benefited them. People talk to, about it to me privately, and it's huge in Silicon Valley. These are mind-boosting substances, um, but they're not willing to talk about it publicly yet. And I'm like, oh, that's where, you know, we talk about wielding your privilege. And I understand there's risks involved, but, you know, every leader can, can play a part um, that not just the privileged few can have safety, uh, uh, you know, access in, and to these substances um, with safety. Absolutely. I think that is huge. And we had the privilege of hearing some folks' stories as well at the, the panel that you hosted too. And it is really transformational in terms of the stories that people share and the experience that they had and really opens up folks' mind as well. Uh, the experience and even if you yourself is, are not thinking about partaking in psychedelic therapy being open to having it as a benefit for others to to leverage who've gone through trauma who have, who have seen it as an open door to, to deal with something as well I think that's important too yeah yes 100 percent Stephen, our time has flown by. But I always like to ask, is there anything I didn't ask that you would like to share with folks who are listening or, you know, underscoring one or two key takeaways, call to action, the mic is yours. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, so one thing I didn't talk about, um, not, a, not a key takeaway, but one thing that I, I'm happy to end with is that psychedelics aren't for everyone. So I do want to add a word of caution I tend to speak very like profusely about the benefits and like, ah, oh, I get so, you know, um, excited about the potential, but you know, it's not a magic pill. It's not a panacea. They enable deep hard work, but there's deep hard work involved. Yeah. So don't take them lightly, do your research, test your drugs, <laughs> you know, be safe and be responsible. 
not a magic magic wand in itself. And yeah. It be a thoughtful yeah. Decision to decide. I fall for that trap sometimes. It is not. It's not. Uh, Stephen, thank you so much for being on Reimagining Company Culture and sharing your insights and stories with, with us today. I really appreciate it. And it was, it's as always good to see you. You too. Thanks, Christina. Of course. And as a reminder for folks who are listening at All Voices, we really believe in employees and employers really making an effort to be seen, heard, and understood and know it's a requirement for the company to succeed overall. Have a good rest of your afternoon, everyone.